Until match forward defensive was as porous as a whore's drawers. <laughs> The successes uh, from Faulty Towers to A Fish Called Wanda, uh, you've been Emmy nominated, BAFTA nominated, won. You've been described as pink, fluffy and moist by Stephen Fry. Uh, a higher accolade I, I doubt has been uttered by anybody. Um, but at the same time, you've had your ups and downs with Hollywood. Um, I'm interested to hear the story of the twits, Roald Dahl's... Oh, oh yes, that was, a, that was a perfect example. Why I, uh, actually, it's why I started doing the stage show. And I'll explain why. Because there was a young fellow called Kirk D'Amico. Now, there's two of them. One's a producer, one's a writer. But this was, this was the writer, D'Amico. And uh, he was much younger than me, and we got on extremely well. He was very au fait with current movies, which I wasn't. And we wrote two movies. We wrote a thing called... Um, with well, the word crude, C R O O D in it, um, and it was about it was an animated movie about cavemen, um, and we wrote that for Jeffrey Katzenberg. And the trouble was that all the decisions in Dreams DreamWorks are made by Jeffrey, and uh, the rest of the activity of DreamWorks is uh, consists of his executives trying to guess what he's going to say when he gets around to reading it. Do you see what I mean? And they're always wrong. So this is very frustrating because you write a script and then you get no feedback at all except feedback from people who have no idea what they're talking about who have all sorts of suggestions which you know aren't right. When Jeffrey eventually came in, he changed an enormous amount of it uh, and he's entitled to do that. My God, he's had an amazing track record. But it got to the point where it was hardly recognizable for me from what I had liked. So I just said, look, I, I don't want to, to do this anymore. I have other things to do and I moved on. But I didn't mind that because Jeffrey's, you know, he's earned the right to do that and they are working on it and it may be made and I may get some sort of a credit though I'll probably take my name off because I think if you don't recognize a movie really there's no point in pretending you wrote it with the twits it was different because I was so excited when I was told about the twits and Kirk was already working on it and he had the idea of a, um, a couple this couple the twits do you are you aware of the story they, they play practical jokes on each other well he developed it to the point where this couple had trained some animals from a circus to carry out a series of robberies and I thought that was such a wonderful and delightful idea that we we developed that and when we handed it in the executive who was Nina someone I can't remember her name she said to us we don't get first drafts like this she said, this is 70, 75% of the way there. And we said, well, well, we're very happy. And we had a meeting and we went and had coffee afterwards and we wrote down the six changes that Nina had requested. And uh, a few weeks later, I emailed uh, Nina. She'd given us the email address and I said, these are the six things we're going to address in the second draft. Do you have anything else you want us to do? And didn't hear anything back. So we, uh, we incorporated those six changes and we vastly improved the ending. We thought the ending was, you know, if we were 75% before, we must have been at least 85% on the second draft. And we went off on holiday, and by the time we got back, we heard they were looking for new writers. <laughs> you know, this is how insane it is. And it was because they had made some suggestions to our producers who didn't have a clue what they were doing. And I thought that they were the producers' ideas, and they were very bad ones anyway, so we ignored them. But we given them the script that they'd loved and made the changes that they'd requested at the meeting. Uh, but because we'd not listened to these bad ideas, um, they were looking for different writers. They didn't even come and discuss it with us. And, and I went in and I talked to them and the woman said, well, I want this. Nina said, I want this. This point is where you need to develop the character more. And we said, no, no, in a comedy, this is the beginning of the chase sequence. So you can't take the time to develop. Uh, uh, you know, to develop character at this point it has to be done beforehand. The other thing was she wanted an opening sequence that revealed that the animals were carrying out the, the, the robbery. And I said, well, well why, why put the unique idea in the first 30 seconds of the film? Let's hold it back a little bit and then we can reveal it and get some fun out of it. No, she said, I wanted it at the beginning. And I said, well, that kind of thinking is why a lot of Hollywood comedies start quite well and fade away. 
In other words, the woman had no idea what she was doing. And I, and I went away for 24 hours, and I came in and I said, Nina, I don't know how to make this script worse to please you. <laughs> And so I just walked away from it, and then it went through three or four more drafts, and then I heard it was with working title, and then I heard they weren't going to have a lot of different animals, they were going to have all monkeys. Oh, how dull is that? And nobody's ever told me anything, because the funny thing about show business, and I, I think, I don't know if people have said this to you, Oscar, is that if you're involved at some stage, nobody ever tells you what happens. So it's always handy if somebody's reading IMDb and they can get you up to speed. Absolutely, or you bump into someone. I mean, it was like I went to a house party once years ago that was um, uh, at, at a house that was owned by Victor Lowndes, who used to run the London Playboy Club. Now, Victor had come to me uh, when he'd seen Monty Python on, on television and said, I love this. He said, but it's never going to get onto American television. You realize that? And I said, yeah, you're right. I know it. He said, let's make a little movie of the best sketches and try and get that into the cinemas on the college campuses. So that's how I knew um, uh, Victor. And Victor invited me for a weekend. And there were a couple of American executives there who were delighted to meet me. And they said, well, we've got news for you. We've just bought the American television rights 40 towers. And we're going to make 40 towers in America. And I said, well, that's, that's very exciting. And they said, well, we're very excited about it. And I said, well, will the Americans understand a small family hotel? Because don't you have all big chains? They said, no, that's not a problem. We think they'll get that. They said, we've only made one chain. I said, all right, what's that? They said, we've written Basil out. <laughs> It's absolutely true. <laughs> so the 40 Towers appeared without Basil Fawlty in it, and B. Arthur, B. Arthur played Sybil, and it was a disaster. We have, to, we have to track this down and find it. It sounds like televisual gold. Then B. Arthur's back, running a seaside hotel. All I can see out of my window is trees. But what did you expect to see out of a window in California? Krakatoa erupting. Amanda's right after condo Thursday, starting at 8, 7, Central and Mountain. Well, they've tried to make it three times, and they always uh, are very pleasant when they meet it. But they take it away, and they always think that they know how to do it. And, and I, I mean, it's absolutely genuine. It's, uh, you know, I just told you the David Dunning thing, that you have to be good at something to know how good you are at it. And that is why so many scripts and so many movies are absolutely absolutely terrible because there's no objective way of people finding out that they're no good at something that they're no good at. If you're a tennis player and you get beaten, six love, six love, six love, you kind of can't really pretend you did very well. <laughs> but if you wrote a novel, you can always say, well, you know, all the famous novels were turned down by publishers at the start, so you can never really learn that you have no talent at all. Now, I'm interested to hear the story how the director of The Lavender Hill Mob, one mm. of the great Ealing comedies, became your co-writer and the director for A Fish Called Wanda. And I think we're coming to the end of our story, so I want to tell the audience what one can learn from somebody who was a comedian and a director in the 50s that you learnt and that now you can pass on. Well, you see, uh, I don't know if this is true anymore, because to some extent, comedy is a matter of psychology of the audience. When I was writing Forty Towers, I remember saying to Connie once, I realized that actually writing comedy is a question of presenting information to the audience in the right order. But it's all about audience psychology, and it may be that the psychology of audiences has changed, because the sort of movies that I used to love watching and I would love to be making are not really movies that you see anymore. They just aren't making those kind of comedies. And I don't know if the fact that all comedies now, or all movies now in America are basically, what is it, aimed at the 17 to 24 males? You know, and the, we're talking about American males who are about as ignorant as ignorance gets. <laughs> um, so you, you can't do, I don't mean they're stupid, I just mean they're completely ignorant. And, and have crummy values. So if you do anything that is, uh, is, is really intelligent, I, I have a movie that I have written, which is, uh, funnily enough, came up about four years ago, and it's about the extent to which people will go to avoid paying tax. 
And Would they move to Switzerland or perhaps Monaco? Well, I'm moving to Monaco because I discovered I can't, well, I ha still have to pay a million dollars a year. And in England, if you have to pay a million dollars a year, you have to earn two million dollars, pay 50% tax, give the million to your ex-wife, and then you're allowed to earn your first penny. Well, <laughs> I can't start the year two million in the red, so I can't do that. But I was thinking about this business about going out and hiding out across borders, and I wrote a really funny, uh, it's not a script yet, it's an outline, but I've suddenly thought, I'm not so sure that anybody wants to watch this kind of comedy anymore. And so between ourselves, um, and don't tell him because I haven't approached him yet, I'm going to see if Hugh Laurie might be interested in playing the lead, because he's great, isn't he? And, but I, I, I think it was almost a little too, it's almost a little too old-fashioned now, because all the, all the comedies that seem to work are these comedies that are just about shock. Although it seems that these shock comedies, the ones that have done well, say the original Hangover or Bridesmaid, have that psychological truth at the kernel of them that drives the story. I think that's true. I, I mean, I watched uh, Hangover, I watched about half of it, and then I just got fed up with it because I didn't think it was technically good enough. It, you know, for someone who spent his life crafting comedy, it just wasn't good enough. But of course, it's hugely popular with the young. So you think, well, if something that you really don't believe in and don't think is particularly good is this popular. Maybe the answer is get out of the business, you know? Well, uh, I think you've just disappointed 700 people by the fact that you may in fact get out of the business. Well, you, if you, you see, um, uh, we were talking just now and you were pointing, uh, I was pointing out that most of the things that I've done as a performer that people really like were things I wrote myself. And if you're going to write a movie, uh, it'll probably take the best part of a year to get it right. Then you have to get it cast and you have to get a director and you have to get, uh, you know, the right first assistant director. And then, of course, you've got to get the finance and then you go into pre-production and then uh, the pre-production is at least three to four months and then you shoot the movie and then there's an editing process of another three to four months and then even if you get the movie right and they want to release it straight away there's an enormously long process of marketing the movie so that from the day you've put the first joke down on paper it's probably two and a half years so if I was to, uh, to launch myself out on a, uh, on a new movie I'd have to put aside some best part of two and a half years of my life which at 72 I don't want to do because when when Fierce Creatures came out, which is not a bad movie. It's quite funny, uh, but it's like most comedies, it's patchy. There's two or three bad scenes at the start, but there's some very, very funny scenes later on. And to try and make a perfectly uh, seamless comedy that remains at a really high level all the way, I mean, it, it's almost never done. You know, if, I, if you say to people, what are the really great comedies that are absolutely consistent the whole way through, people can come up with eight or ten. If you ask that about dramas, they can come up with 200. I mean, it's very, very rare to make a perfect comedy. Most of them are uneven. But the point I was making was, I spent two and a half years on Fierce Creatures, and the second weekend that it was in the cinemas, they re-released Star Wars. Well, you can't control that, you see. It's too, too much of a gamble. Although, I have to say that um, anybody watching Monty Python's The Life of Brian or A Fish Called Wanda are still enthralled, um, amused and titillated. But also, at the same time, there's that comment that comes with the humour. The uh, desire to provoke, to condemn, comes with the impulse to amuse. It can do. I think that's totally true of, of, of uh, Life of Brian. I think we all, the joke there was to make fun of people, not of religion, but of the way that some people practice religion. And people think, well, what do you mean? I'll give you an example. When I was uh, coming up with the character of Otto for Fish Called Wanderer, I found a New York, oh, sorry, I'm not New York, the Los Angeles magazine, a two-page spread that said, uh, advertising a meditation weekend, the headline was, Buddhism gives you the competitive edge.
And what you find with a lot of religions is that people take the religion and then turn it on its head so that it turns out to be almost the opposite, almost the, 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 yes, the polar opposite of what the founder of the religion was trying to teach. I mean, Obama recently had to explain to some evangelicals that it was not contrary to the teaching of Christ to have a higher rate of tax on the very rich. <laughs> You know, as though there was any real doubt as to whether it said blessed are the rich or blessed are the poor. No, it was, do you, do you know what I mean? And that uh, well-known phrase about it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. I mean, it's pretty obvious what that's saying. And yet in America, Christ is sort of regarded as the founder of capitalism and is sort of treated as a kind of investment advisor. You know? yeah. Well, he was a builder, <laughs> carpenter. <laughs> The carpenter, that's a good job. Now, I think, um, sadly, we've, we've come to the end of the time that we have uh, to talk to Mr. Cleese today. Um, but I think, before we let you go, as one of the few people in this auditorium who has actually made a movie about the meaning of life, <laughs> and you've experienced um, the ups and downs, the thrills, the highs, the lows of marriage, of... of well, I guess, of a, a career that only one or two of us could look upon with um, a jaded eye, and the rest of us can only look up to and say, well, actually, that's how I would have done it. Um, is there something that you've learned that sticks with you? Um, that well, you a lot of it is to do with luck. So be lucky. Uh, yeah, in the, in the, okay. Yes, be lucky. I think in the, in the stage show I talk about the way I was plucked out of obscurity by David Frost and I was lucky enough to work with Ronnie Barker, Ronnie Corbett at a time when I'd never done television. And then I was lucky enough, uh, David gave me my show, uh, my own show several years before anyone else would have done. And you just get lucky and you meet the right people. I think you just have to, and you have to also accept that there's going to be failures there. People are very frightened of failure. But somebody said to me once, do you know that the most successful salesmen are also the ones who have the highest number of, of turndowns? Do you, do you see what I'm, what I'm getting at? They're successful sell because they, they try to sell to so many people. They get lots of refusals, but they get lots of acceptances too. And I think sometimes it's difficult to go on when you've had a failure. And some, one of the things I admire about some people is they just keep doing it. I mean, nobody remembers this, but Clint Eastwood at one point produced seven stinkers in a row. Everyone's forgotten that. Woody Allen has started making good films again after a period of about 20 years when he was shooting what my son-in-law called first drafts, you know. So the great thing is the sheer damn persistence, I think. Okay. And, and so pray for luck. In the words of Winston Churchill, keep buggering on. Yes, keep buggering on. He was a lovely man. I read a wonderful thing the other day after 1945, you know, we'd won the war. And at least I think that's right, isn't it? Because my memory is not what it was. Um, <laughs> and and uh, the, the first thing that happened was that the British people voted Winston Churchill out of power. And he was sitting apparently in Downing Street uh, with the radio results coming in pretty amazed. And his uh, wife, Clementine, said, well, never mind, never mind, Winston, perhaps it's, a, perhaps it's a blessing in disguise. And Churchill said, well, if it is, it's a bloody good disguise. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, that's very, very generous applause for the works of Winston Churchill, but please uh, put your hands together for, I guess, one of the icons of... What do you mean, world? one of the... What do you mean? <laughs> Sorry, please put your hands together for the greatest human Thank being you. that has ever lived, Mr. John, please. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate it. It seems totally normal to me. Well, here we sit, surrounded by some fairyland fantasy. And the really absurd thing is, most people don't seem to notice. <laughs>